Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part two of the section of the book titled Matrices. In this video, we will be discussing matrix multiplication. As motivation for the definition of matrix multiplication, let's consider the question of whether the matrix of the product of two linear maps is the product of the matrices. The product of two linear maps is defined provided the ranges and domains match up in the appropriate way. However, we have not yet defined the product of two matrices, so this question does not yet make sense. We define the sum and scalar product of matrices using the obvious definitions, so you might think that something correspondingly simple would work for multiplication. In other words, the natural thing to try is to define the product of two matrices to be the product of the corresponding entries, just like we did for addition. However, that definition turns out not to be useful. And in particular, with that definition, it would not be true that the matrix of the product of two linear maps is the product of the matrices. We need to do a little calculation to see how we should define matrix multiplication. In addition to the two vector spaces v and w that we've previously been considering, we now need a third vector space. Let's call it u. Suppose we have bases v1 up to vn of v, w1 up to wm of w, and u1 up to up of u. Consider linear maps t from u to v and s from v to w. Thus, s times t makes sense. It's a linear map from u to w. And our question is, is the matrix of s t equal to the matrix of s times the matrix of t? Let's let a denote the matrix of s and c denote the matrix of t. Of course, these matrices are with respect to the bases listed above. Now let's fix k between 1 and p, and let's look at what s t does to the basis vector u sub k. We have st of u sub k is s applied to t u sub k. t u sub k is an element of the vector space v, so it's some linear combination of the basis vectors v1 up to vn. And the specific linear combination is given by the entries of the matrix C. Thus, t u sub k is the vector shown in parentheses on the first line here. To get from the first line above to the second line, we simply use the linearity properties of S. Now look at the second line in the right column. The vector S v sub r is an element of the vector space W. Thus, it is a linear combination of the basis vectors W1 up to Wm. The specific coefficients of that linear combination are given by the matrix A, which is the matrix of the linear map S. That gets us from the second line to the third line. Getting from the third line to the fourth line is just rearranging and changing the order of summation. We have now written st applied to u sub k as a linear combination of the vectors w1 up to wm. By the definition of the matrix of the linear map st, the coefficient of wj in this sum is the entry in row j column k of the matrix of s times t. Thus, we have the following formula for the matrix of st. The entry in row j column k is given by the sum shown here. Notice that in this sum, j and k are fixed. The j appears on the left as the first subscript of a. The k appears on the right as the last subscript of c. And the dummy summation variable r appears twice you can think of those two instances of R as canceling each other out. The last formula shown here indicates how we should define the product of a matrix A and a matrix C. I remember the first time I saw this formula. It was presented without motivation. But now we have great motivation for how to define matrix multiplication. This definition is forced upon us if we want to have that the matrix of the product of two linear maps is equal to the product of the matrices. Let's now go to the formal definition. 
Suppose A is an M by N matrix and C is an N by P matrix. Then we define the product A times C to be the M by P matrix whose entry in row J, column K, is given by the equation shown here. This is just the equation we derived in the previous slide using as motivation that the matrix of S times T should equal the matrix of S times the matrix of T. If you look at the formula above, you will see that the entry in row J, column K of the matrix AC is computed by taking row J of the matrix A and column K of the matrix C, multiplying together the corresponding entries, and then adding up. Notice that the product of two matrices A and C is defined only when the number of columns of A is equal to the number of rows of C. Let's look at an example. Here we have a matrix with three rows and two columns, so it's a three by two matrix. That's our first matrix. Our second matrix has two rows and four columns, so its size is two by four. Therefore, the product is going to have three rows and four columns, a three by four matrix. For our example, let's focus on the entry in row two, column th four of the product matrix. That entry is five, and it's shown in red on the right to highlight it for you. That's row two, column four. That means we take row two of the first matrix, those are the entries are three, four, again shown in red, and column four of the second matrix, the entries three, negative one. We multiply corresponding entries together and then add. Thus we compute three times three plus four times negative one. 3 times 3 is 9, plus 4 times negative 1 is negative 4, 9 minus 4 is 5, and thus you see a 5 in red on the right. At this point, you should pause the video and make sure you can verify all the other entries of this product matrix are correct. If you can do that, you're on your way to having a good understanding of how to deal with matrix multiplication. Now we have the theorem that if T is a linear map from U to V, and S is a linear map from V to W, then the matrix of ST is equal to the matrix of S times the matrix of T. At this point, this theorem is no surprise. We define matrix multiplication to force this to be true. And we've really already done the proof. The proof is just the calculation that we did as motivation for how to define matrix multiplication. I now want to introduce some useful notation for denoting the rows and the columns of a matrix. Suppose A is a matrix. Then A, J, comma, dot denotes the jth row of A. And A, dot, comma, K denotes the kth column of A. This is pretty easy to remember because we always think of rows first and then columns when we're dealing with subscripts of a matrix A. Let's look at an example. Suppose A is the matrix shown here. Then A of two comma dot means row two of A. Just looking at A, we can see that is the matrix with one row and three columns consisting of one, nine, seven. Similarly, A dot comma two denotes column two of A. Looking at the matrix A, we can see that that second column consists of the numbers four and nine and thus A dot comma two is as shown here, a two by one matrix. We will use this notation to present some alternative ways of thinking about matrix multiplication. Let's look at one more example of matrix multiplication. Here we have a one by two matrix multiplied by a two by one matrix. Thus the result should be a one by one matrix. It's easy to compute the entry in this one by one matrix it's 3 times 6, which is 18, plus 4 times 2, which is 8. 18 plus 8 is 26. Thus, the product of these two matrices is the 1 by 1 matrix containing just the entry 26. For 1 by 1 matrices, we sometimes simply write them as a number. So we can remove the parentheses and write this as just 26. With that convention, we have the following nice rule for matrix multiplication. Suppose A and C are matrices, and the number of columns of A is equal to the number of rows of C, so that A times C makes sense. Then the entry in row J, column K, 
of a times c equals rho j of a times column k of c. Make sure you think about this theorem so that you understand why it's true. We now want to give two more alternative ways to think about matrix multiplication. Thus suppose a and c are matrices, and the number of columns of a is equal to the number of rows of c, so that the matrix a times c makes sense. Then this formula says that the kth column of the matrix a times c is equal to a times the matrix consisting of the kth column of c. Again, please ponder the definitions to make sure you understand why this is correct. For our second alternative way of thinking about matrix multiplication, suppose again that a and c are matrices and that the number of columns of a equals the number of rows of c so that a times c makes sense. Then the jth row of a times c is equal to the jth row of a times c. Again, ponder and understand. Sometimes a matrix with only one column is called a column vector. There's a special way to think about matrix multiplication when the second matrix is a column vector. Thus, suppose A is an n by n matrix and C is an n by 1 matrix. In other words, C is a column vector. Then we have the formula here for A times C. This formula shows that A times C is a linear combination of the columns of A, with the scalars of multiplying the columns coming from C. Let's look at an example of using this formula. Here we have a 2 by 3 matrix multiplying a column vector. As you can see, the entries of the column vector are 3, negative 1, 2, and the product of these two matrices is gotten by taking the columns of the first matrix, multiplying each one by the appropriate corresponding constant from the column matrix, and then adding those up. Again, make sure you understand this example. Sometimes a matrix that has only one row is called a row vector. We conclude this video by giving a result for multiplying a row vector by a matrix. Here's the formula. As you can see, if A is a row vector and C is a matrix, then A times C is a linear combination of the rows of C, with the scalars that multiply the rows coming from A. Let's look at an example. Here we have a row matrix 3, negative 1. That's a 1 by 2 matrix and we're multiplying it by a 2 by 3 matrix, so the result should be a 1 by 3 matrix, in other words, another row vector. And as you can see, we take 3 times the first row plus negative 1 times the second row, the 3 and the 1 coming from the row vector, and then just do the arithmetic to get the result. This concludes the final part of the video on matrices.